The Legit Podcast is sponsored by Montrex. Montrex is a cutting edge sportswear brand empowering athletes across the world, built to enhance performance and give you confidence to go the extra mile. They've got some of the most incredible products at montrex.com. There is a link below this video. Click the link and at checkout, enter the code LEGIT for 15% off your order. That's L-E-G-I-T, all one word. Everything from jackets, cargo pants, gym tops, t-shirts, uh, running jackets, running pants. Everything is on their website and they sponsor some of the most incredible athletes. Everything from UFC fighter Leon Edwards and a good friend of the podcast, uh, boxer Jazza Dickens. So click the link below, use the code LEGIT at checkout for 15% off your order. Right, welcome to the Legit Podcast. It's me, Jordan Neal, on my own today um, because in the guest seat is the main man, Andy Grant. Nice one for having me. Well, how's it feel being on your, your own podcast? Yeah, it's going to be, um, you know what, it's going to be nice to do to be able to just be completely open and honest. Yeah. Um, not that I've not been on other podcasts, but I guess it's, um, obviously you know me really well. Mm. And um, I don't know, maybe people have listened to the podcast but don't really know my story properly and the ins and outs of it. So it'll be good to um... Yeah, to be fair, I think people have asked for it, haven't they? You know, people have asked repeatedly for what's Andy's story or, you know, might have read your book, but just sort of want to hear it from from your mouth. So let's go right back. Andy Grant Bourne, Bootle. What do you remember of, like, obviously your childhood and growing up? I had a boss childhood. I always think, I always make that joke and say, you know, you're only when I, you know, grew up and went travelling and stuff and seen other parts of, especially England, the UK, you realise that probably Bootle's rough as fuck. <laughs> yeah. But at the time, you don't know any different, do you? Mm. So I had a great childhood, like, you know, just playing footy all the time. Um, I think my school report said the same um, from year one to year 11. Just, you know, you know, quite a bright lad, but likes talking too much, likes being one of the lads too much. I guess that was kind of my, my whole childhood, really. Um, but no, I had a great childhood. Um, my mum... Um, she worked as a, as a dinner lady at times and all the time she was just obviously looking after the, me and my two sisters my dad was a fireman um, and yeah dead close to um, my nan um, my nan and my auntie and my granddad quite a small family but yeah loved it great child just a typical like working class you know your dad's at work your mum's at home you're like playing footy at school yeah biggest you know things in your life was just you know playing footy after school with your mates mm. playing on the computer playing championship manager just then <laughs> to do with football really growing up and um yeah it's yeah, a great childhood love was you always passionate about about footy yeah yeah always loved playing footy yeah my dad got me into um you know playing sunday league and stuff um and yeah from even school just always remember being part of teams in school and sports day loved sports day um but football was obviously just a massive massive um passion for me um, so much so like I had trials when I was a kid for the pool um, and then just got to that level and realised I'm not going to be a footballer <laughs> it was just like levels above but yeah that's probably one of my best memories I have playing at the academy in Kirby and my mum and dad come to watch me and my granddad mm. and um, so yeah just always loved footy being sporty competitive um, and yeah just a, I'd say just a pretty normal inner city scouse childhood really yeah obviously at 12 you go through something that obviously no kids you go for you lose your mum what sort of I mean I don't know if you can still remember it as clear as day but sort of how do you go from being a happy go lucky kid to sort of being told you know your mum's gonna your mum's you know not here no more without doubt it's the um, it's been the biggest thing to ever impact my life you mm. know forget getting blown up in Afghanistan losing my mum was by far the hardest thing I've ever had to go through and um, it makes me sad now that I was 12 when she died, I'm 33 now. You think there's so much more of my life that she hasn't been a part of than she mm. actually was, which is um, which is heartbreaking. And, and yeah, without doubt, it's, it's, it's impacted me and affected me the most. And I still remember it all, like certain parts of it really vividly. I remember being out playing, I think I was playing um, Manhunt or something. And my mum rang me, I'd, I think I'd just got a mobile for emergencies, like never had no credit <laughs> on it, but like, you know, in case something happened. And I must have had it on silent because I was hiding behind a car or something while everyone's looking for me, playing Manhunt. And I looked and I had a voicemail and I listened to the voicemail back and it was my mum just saying, Hi, oh, Aranda, just rang, um, just see where you are, mate. Um, hope, hope you're okay, I'll see you soon. But as she said, see you soon, a voice, a voice broke at the end of it as if she was going to cry or something. And I was like, 
like it probably didn't, but in my head I was like, something's not right there. And I, uh, I went right. I've got to go home. And I ran all the way home. And uh, my mum just said, "Oh, why did you come home?" And I said, "Something's the matter. What's up?" And she was like, "There's nothing the matter." I said, "Yeah, there is. What's up?" And she said, "Oh, no. And I've just got to go into a, um, I've just got to go into the hospital for a couple of days. But it's nothing to worry about. And nothing. Don't worry." And and all that. And she'd been, she'd been getting bruises on her legs and stuff. She was moaning, saying that my dad was a, you know, a wriggly sleeper, and he like, you know, kicked her in the night or something. And she was getting big, massive bruises. And she'd went to doctors, they'd done blood tests and, and sent her into the hospital. And and yes, she was diagnosed with leukemia. And I only realised that it was a big deal when my dad wrote me a letter to, to send into school. And you'd have, you know, your personal diary. And I, I give my dad my diary and he said, I'll write you a note in case you get upset and stuff. So I give him this diary and said, Oh no, I'll just write it on a piece of paper. And I said, No, this diary is what it's for, you know, write it in the diary. And he said, no, I don't want it to be in your diary all the time. Just, you know. Mm. I, so I give this letter to Mr. Riley, who was my head teacher. I want to give this letter to him. He just put his hand over his mouth. He just went, oh, my God. And then at that point, I was thinking, fucking hell, what is this leukemia? Yeah. And it was only at that point I thought, oh, fucking hell, this isn't like just my ma's going to be in hospital for a few days. This could be um, this could be something a bit, a bit shit. And, and yeah, she, she got diagnosed in the May. And so I was actually 11 when she got diagnosed. And then she um, she was in hospital then for the next three or four months until she passed away in September. Was it always, from your understanding, was it always like, you know, was there a chance of her beating it or was it just sort of one of them where it was just caught late? And... No, I think it was caught, you know, as early as maybe, I don't know, you could catch it. But there the, the, the always was a hope that obviously she'd, she'd beat it. I, I think now my dad... If you'd asked me dad now, I think he would have said, you know, he wouldn't go for treatment and he'd just, you know, whisk us away for a few months on holiday because mm. it was really tough seeing her kind of go downhill. You know, obviously, the chemotherapy just really weakened her, her body. Obviously, her hair starts to fall out. And yeah. I had a big thing. I always used to twizzle my mum's hair. And it was that was hard, you know, to when your mum had to, you know, shave her own head. Um, and seeing her like that, it was, yeah, that was that was obviously really tough. Um one of the worst bits in the hospital, what I remember is she, um, and I only found out years later, her heart stopped beating once. She, um, We went in to see her, and at that point she'd gone really low, and she was in an isolation room, and we had to put masks on, you know, and all like, like COVID times, yeah. basically, had to go in and see her, because her immune system was that low, you know, even a cold could kill her. We went in to see my mum, and me, my dad, my two sisters, and she was asleep. She was sitting in the room, kind of just waiting for her to wake up, and she woke up and, and started having like a fit or a seizure and just seeing my mum have a, have a fit like that my dad just said Andrew run and get the doctors and I ran out the room and just said someone needs to help quick and then the next minute it was just doctor upon doctor nurses running to this room and my dad and my sisters got ushered out and we had to go in, in the, this waiting room I remember thinking like is my mum going to die hmm. like I've just seen my mum have a seizure is, is, is she going to die Thankfully, she didn't. Um, but only years later, my dad told me that she actually like did flatline and they got her back to life. Um, so yeah, it was just a, a really shit kind of six weeks holiday, yeah. put it that way, because that was obviously all happening from the May till September. And then when the September did come, yeah, that's when that's when she passed away. You said before that like, you had a feeling like I've got to get home when you're playing man up with your mates. At that age, did something like I don't know switch and you like did you grow up? Do you know what I mean? As a kid, like when you see, because no kid, no, not many kids will see the mum, you know, in situations where she's having a seizure or be told, you know, your mum's very ill or whatever. Did did you grow up quicker than a usual, you know, 12 year old kid would? Yeah, I feel like I did. Yeah, I feel like I lost a bit of my childhood, mm. even just, even at six weeks' holidays when my mum was sick, you know, that kind of carefree six weeks' holidays when you're in year seven or eight, I think year eight it was, year nine. Every day I was, I had this guilt of, Shall I go with my mates and play footy what I want to do? Or do I go and see my mum in hospital? So then every day there was this guilt. If I didn't go to the hospital one day, I'd feel so guilty on my mum. And then if I didn't go with my mates, I'd feel like I was losing my childhood. So I kind of lost a bit of that, what's it called, the innocence maybe of a kid. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had to grow up because obviously I had two little sisters as well. So even like the, don't get me wrong, I was still probably annoying to them. But like... I couldn't be a kid and mess around probably as much as I wanted to because 
my dad was stressed out looking after two, you know, three kids on his own. You know, we never had our mum around. It, so it was, I probably didn't notice it at the time, but when I look back now, I do feel a bit, a bit aggrieved at like that. I did, mm. I did lose that innocence and that, you know, that childhood. When, so when your mum passes away, obviously then, you know, you've got a household of your dad, your two sisters and you. Does the thing not change, but do you like, does the whole dynamic in your family, do you know what I mean? Does it change as your dad sort of still going to work as a fireman? Like, is your, what's your household like after that? Yeah, it massively changed. As you know, my dad's very, he's like very old school, hardened fella, you know, not very emotional. And my mum was always the super emotional one. I mean, I was a real mum's boy when I was a kid and I used to tell my mum I loved her a hundred times a day. And we'd have this thing in the night where I'd shout into my mum and say like, love you mum. She'd say, love you too. But I always had to say like, love you last. So I'd say like, good night, love you. She'd go, night, love you. And I'd say, right, last time now, love you. And then my dad would be lying in bed thinking, will you fucking shut up? <laughs> and then because he'd spoke, then I had to speak again. And um, so anyway, that's going on. And then when my mum dies, I think like, I shouted in one night, you know, like, night dad, love you. And he was like, night, love you. And I was like, last time, I'll love you. And he went, love And it just didn't, you know, it just didn't feel like that dynamic. It just had yeah. like, gone. So obviously my dad's done an amazing job of, of bringing up, you know, me and my two sisters. But obviously, you know, if, if you've got a mum there who's a proper mum's mum, you know, mm. making sure everything ticks in the family and that gets taken out the family, things are going to change. But uh, the fire brigade were great with my dad. They gave him as much time off as he needed. And my nan and my granddad and my auntie stepped up. And then we kind of spent then my next childhood, kind of next phase of childhood, my teens, living between like my house and my nan's house. So, yeah, it, it just changed a lot. I think when I really, really noticed that my mum would gone, is again, I'd never seen my dad cry. And the night after the funeral, I woke up in my nans and I heard him crying. And I, and I looked into the can, you could see down the hallway in the toilet, and he was um, he was crying his eyes out. And I'd never seen my dad cry. And I was thinking, fucking hell. I, yeah. it's, obviously I knew my mum had died, and I knew it was shit, but I'd never seen my dad, a grown fella, break down like that. And um, I went down to see my nan, and I was like, that's my dad crying, but like, you know, bawling, like wailing. And my nan went, you're gonna have to, you know, you're gonna have to step up, mate, you're gonna have to look after him. And at that moment, I was like, fucking hell, like my ma's dead. Hmm. Yeah, it was fucking... I know you, like, obviously we all feel like this to a certain extent, but is your childhood sort of split, split in two, if you understand what I mean? Like, are you Andy Grant up to 12 and then, you know, 12 and onwards? Are you just not a different person, but do you look at things different? Are you approaching school different, your mate, footy? Like, are you a different kid or are you still sort of... You know, I've never even thought of it like that. Um, I was definitely, yeah, more carefree, I think, yeah. Um, I don't think I kind of massively went off the rails and stuff like that in school because of it. Um, but I think yeah, as I got older, I think definitely made decisions that would have been different if my mum was still being around, you know, one joining the Marines and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I think it was. But again, even after my mum dad, still had a great childhood, still had like a great school life and great friends and stuff like that. But um, but yeah, I do always think would it have been different? Mm. I don't think I actually view it differently because I, despite losing my mum, you know, my family and my friends all done a great job of like rallying around me at times and stuff. And you know, I still still feel pretty grateful that I had mm. the childhood that I had when you're coming to the end of school then sort of you know the years passing by are you, what do you want to be is there a plan is the you know I'm going to leave school and I'm going to do X or you know dog's not happy <laughs> yeah. always again the most. but yeah, is there a plan or is they just sort of you know finish school sixth form yeah no plan at all I um, I think it's such a hard decision isn't it for mm-hmm. kids anyway um, for all kids what to do and I was alright in school but did not have a clue what I wanted to do. And my dad was a bit like, you know, you're not just sitting around here, you know, you're getting a job or you're going to sixth form. So I just kind of went to sixth form just because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I ended up studying English and history at A-level, but again, no real desire to go into uni, no desire to go into any particular line of work. I just thought it'd give me another couple of years to get a couple more qualifications behind me and then I'll see what I want to do. But yeah, I just think, it's like what we was talking about on the pod, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. I mean, if I knew now, you know, the benefits of your university or, you know, going travelling and bloody hell, you know, I'd be working in like a ski lodge or something. I would have got a one-way ticket to bloody, you know, Switzerland or something. I don't know, I would have tried, like to have tried different things, but at the time, you don't know anything else. 
and I just found myself going into sixth form, which I didn't really take serious at all. You no, know, I spent too much time just talking in the common room to girls and just, you know, bunking off class and um, I didn't really enjoy it. And even though I wasn't stupid, it was a big, I felt it was a big jump, kind of academically, and I struggled a little bit. Um, and then in job wise, I was working in Sainsbury's and JD, um, just doing anything to kind of get by while I was in sixth form, really. Mm. But but very quickly knew that it, it just wasn't for me. Yeah, I mean, knowing you like that that sort of menial, sort of you know, nothing between jobs. It's just so far from what I yeah. imagine you to enjoy. So when did you sort of think? <coughs> when did the Marines become an option? When did that sort of life become an option? I think as well. I, I relate a lot of stuff back to my mum because I think because I was different because you know my mum had died and it doesn't happen to a lot of people I always felt a little bit different and not maybe couldn't always fit in sometimes and not so much not fit in but I don't know I, I thought about things in a different way and then going through six form I saw an advert for the Royal Marines on the TV <clears throat> and there was a kid who was going through like challenges and he's kind of underwater and his, his, his trousers get caught and it's like would you quit here and he struggles a bit longer and says, we should quit here. And then in the end, he gets up and he's like, <gasps> and then he has to carry on with this assault course. And it says, like, if you think you've got what it takes, or 99.99% need not apply. And my dad was like, yeah, I'd have a go at doing something like that. And it's just like a flipping comment off the cuff. And I thought, you know, well, that sounds pretty, pretty cool. And I, um, I Googled it, like went on the computer and then was like, fucking hell, it looks all right there. And I guess it was never I want to be a Marine. I guess it was subconsciously my dad had quite a cool job being in the fire brigade. Yeah. And I was like, you know what, I'll give that a go. And I was never ever like army by army as a kid or nothing like that. So much so that when I did join the Marines, <clears throat> like they talk about going in, in the field on exercise. And I'm thinking like, where's this field we're going to? <laughs> <laughs> what, just a random patch yeah, of grass? Like, everyone, we're going, on, we're going in the field. I'm like, to do what? What's the fuck's this field? You know, so I didn't really know a whole lot about the Marines. But I guess I just fell in love with the the brotherhood, the family, the camaraderie, the always having a laugh. And, and maybe that's something, again, subconsciously, with not having my mum and having that mm. family broke up. Maybe I was searching for something within the Marines. Yeah, I think sort of, you know, we'll go through your Marine journey now, but I think going into somewhere where, you know, you've got a very important job, of course you have, but you still retain that childish side, don't you? You're surrounded by men and Absolutely, all lads. Yeah. You, and you still, you know, the sort of the pressure's off, so to speak, in terms of... You know, you you can't have banter and everything's not so serious in your life. Not that it was at home, but you were thrown into a situation mm. where you had to grow up. And I guess being in the Marines, you can sort of let that child aside back out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, hundred percent. Great analogy because it, it was like that. It was a just a big boys' club. You know, joking. I would say it's like it's like Peter Pan but with guns, and it's like it felt like that. Do you know what I mean? You were you were well respected. You were the elite. You know, soldiers of the UK, but. At the same time, you're just a big bunch of jokers as well. Like, you know, fellas who've got, you know, the hearts in the right place, you know, a lot of good people. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, just who've got high standards and expect a lot of themselves, but, you know, just really good people. And I guess it was that lore of, of all of that mixed together that made me think, you know what, I want to give this a go. And yeah, it was the best decision I ever made. How would you go from Google and then to like day, not day one, but like saying like I'm, I'm applying? Do you know what I mean? How do you go from. This might be a thing to, I'm doing this. Well, I went on and meet the Marines Day, and I met them at uh, the Liver Buildings, and they picked us up in a minivan and took us down to Alka, and and I just remember getting on this minibus, and I'm obviously not gay, but I, I fell in love with these two fellas. You know, they was I was 16, 17 at the time, and these two lads must have been 23, 24, good-looking lads, you know, massive, ripped in good shape. Um, and they were talking about all the shagging they'd done the night before, you know, they weren't from Liverpool, but they were here for the night and talking about how great it was. And they had this lingo that I didn't understand. You know, they were talking about run, a run ashore, which means a night out. And they were talking about getting the wets in, which means getting the beers in. And they've got this little language between each other and, I'm, and they're just laughing. And I'm there thinking, like, they're getting paid to do this. Like, this is... And so I just fell in love with these two lads and just wanted to be them, you know, wanted to be mates with them. And I think that's what made me think, nah, I, I want to I wanna be a Marine. And um, yeah, went on to meet the Marines. They went back, filled out the application form. You know, you have to do written tests and then a physical test. And then you go down to Limston, where you do your basic training for something called a PRMC, pre-Royal Marine course. You go down there for two or three days 
and it's a chance for you to look at them and also them to look at you and if you if you pass that course you get given a pair of boots to wear in while you wait for your kind of enlistment date and it was a tough few days but I was obviously trained hard for it I thankfully passed and got the boots and I remember getting in at Lime Street and I, I put the boots on and my dad was at work at the time and I got a taxi to um, his fire station and put the boots on well enough here thinking about it and I walked hmm. in the fire station with the boots on and he was like do you pass I was like look at my boots and he was like fucking hell he probably told everyone I was already in the yeah. Marines at this point but um, so to, to get in the Marines just to get in was a, was a big achievement and uh, I was just, just made up them boots like like you know for someone who wants to be a Marine is that like the World Cup do you know what I mean is that like right I've I've got a shot now yeah because I mean and you weren't even a Marine that was just yeah. for you to start training Mm-hmm. But you know what I mean? It's like you're going for a trial for Liverpool and I'm going, right, you know, if you pass this trial, we're going to give you a pair of footy boots for, for the start of the season. Yeah. And you've got to wear them in over the summer. It was just like, fucking hell, wow. So that was just, it was that it was hard to get to that point. And then that was just so you can start week one, day one. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it was a, that was a big thing. So when you, you you drop in then, as you say, on, you know, day one, week one, what are the... F- is, is, are you nervous are you like you know you're stepping into the unknown is it or like is is the training what a normal person like me would expect in terms of you know someone like clean cutting that shouting at you and you yeah, know yeah I mean I, I very naively the first kind of marine I ever met was a guy called uh, Nick Hay and um, Haig and uh, he was a scouser he was only from Netherton like two <laughs> minutes away and I very naively thought oh great you know fuck another scouser here and then very quickly it's like right shut the fuck up go here go there and you're like oh and God, it's not maybe this friendly scouse like you know we all are type thing and um, just a bit of a baptism of fire really everything's like a million miles an hour you're like a bit of a rabbit in headlights and I would describe training or the first half of training anyway it's just a lot of bullshit just to get you to quit yeah. you know so you, you, you're not learning not to jump out of helicopters and you know all this amazing kind of cool things you see on, on films a lot of it's just bullshit just to see you know if you got what it takes to kind of to push through and um, yeah absolutely loved it though it was great just like the it was structure routine to it and you know you were surrounded by kind of similar like minded people and um, yeah just just loved it it was great would you feel then like what people would say at home then into the train like obviously it's difficult but are you not thinking like sod this do you know what I mean I'm, I'm going to go and get a job and <laughs> you know, teaching history or something. No. Are you yeah. loving it? Yeah, I loved it, yeah. Don't get me wrong, I struggled. I struggled a lot because, like I said before, I wasn't, like, the military mindset. I didn't have a fucking clue what it was. I just loved, like, God, I'm with all these gang of new mates. Do you know mm. what I mean? I'm like, this is brand new adventure. It was just like, again, being a kid again. I, I almost naively, and possibly people might think stupid, didn't kind of see the end picture was I'm going to be a Royal Marines commando going to war. It was just like, wow, I wonder if I've got what it takes to do this Royal Marine commando training. You know, everyone said it's so hard, I wonder if I can do it. So I just kind of went through it, a bit naively, you could say, but but just loved it, though, it was great. Did you, So how long's the training then from, like, obviously... 30, 32 weeks. And that is that continuous, or you go, do you go home, or...? You get, um, <clears throat> I think you get a long weekend after week three, but then obviously you get two weeks off at Easter, three weeks off in the summer, and two weeks off at Christmas, so if your training goes over them, that's when you get your time off. Yeah, but did you feel like, sort of... Did you improve across the time? Like you said before, you you went in, you thought, oh, can I pass this? But mm. by like week, you know, when you're approaching 25, 26, are you starting to think, no, I'm going to be a fucking good Royal Marine, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was certain things that I failed along the way and stuff. Oh, I never ever failed anything physically. I was always on the, on, the, on the mark with that. But yeah, certain things that you'd expected to learn and pass and standards, you know, weren't always metro trains. So you're redoing certain things and stuff, but... But yeah, throughout the whole 32 weeks, you're improving more and more and feel much more competent. And, and then by the end of training, you know, you're ready to go and join a commando unit. Mm. That's what the great thing is about the Royal Marines. It's such a professional organisation. You know, you can see the improvement throughout. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They're not expecting you to be the best soldier in the world on week one, day one. But by the end of it, you know, you know you're pretty accomplished. Yeah. Does it change the people who are teaching you from, you know, back and all, do this, do this, be there, you know, you're, so do, does it change in yeah. terms of the start in and respect the start? Yeah, 100%, yeah. Yeah, it's all like the kind of man management skills, I guess, you know, mm. they're going to be hard on you, they're going to make you want to quit, but then when you're getting to weeks 25, 26, 27, the, 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 they're then looking at you thinking, 
in a couple of years' time, I could be standing alongside them. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So they, they want you to improve and they're helping you and, and guiding you rather than kind of just saying you're fucking shit, you. And so it, it does get better as, as it goes on. What's the process of training and then being told then that, you know, you're a Royal Marine, you're going to be sort of selected to go to to wars or to be po- posted somewhere? What's that process? Well, once you pass, get to the end of the training, you do your 30 mile, get your Green Beret, and then you pick what commando unit you're going off to. And I chose to go to 4-5 Commando that are based up in Arbroath in Scotland. And just whatever was going on at the time in that world. Um, and for me, 4-5 Commando were actually out in Afghanistan at the time. So I'd just turn up for work every morning. And you'd literally get, you know, you'd, you'd say, right, we need a few volunteers. So you put your hand up. And it was so funny, you'd either got sent to Iraq, to Afghanistan, or to Hull <laughs> to learn how to train. <laughs> I don't know what was best or what was worst. But... Um, yeah, at the time they needed drivers, so they sent you to Hull to get your uh, HGV license and all that. Um, and it was just like, yeah, you know, so you turned up every morning for work, volunteering, and you didn't know by the end of the day where you'd be. That's fascinating. So you could just be like, so you uh, obviously you get to choose what what sort of commando you go to. That's your decision. Yeah, and but then, you can put in it. You don't always get it, but you can yeah, put in your preference. Yeah, and then obviously they then when you get there they say right, it could be like you turn it off to. Iraq, you tend to go and get your HTV license. Mm. At this point, though, you do you understand <clears throat> like Iraq and, and this stuff, or like do you know wh- what I'm trying to get at is do you start to take interest in what's happening over there because you know that maybe this is an outcome where I could be, you know, put on the ground here. Yeah, there were certain points throughout training where it got real. I had a um, I had a PTI called Ben Novak, who um, he was a scouser, you know, a bit of a legendary marine, held loads of records in the Marines and um, he was sadly killed in Iraq halfway through training and um, he was my trainer for a bit then he went up to 4-5 went up to Iraq and was killed and I remember being on a training exercise at like week 22 24 or something and uh, getting the news that Ben had died and the training team started hammering us they were like you're a fucking shit you're a this you're a that because they knew Ben and friends with him and he kind of just took it out on us and it was then you're thinking Fucking hell, God, we're training, mm. and then in a couple of months we're going to be ready to go out to Iraq, just like Ben did, and and Ben was killed. So there were certain points throughout training, and realised like this is mm. this is getting serious now. How old are you at this point, like going through through training and stuff? Um, seventeen and eighteen. See, that's what fascinates me because you, you know, just chatting here, you <coughs> sign up because of an advert on TV, and you, you know your dad's like, "I'll give that a go," and in thirty weeks or whatever. Nine months, yeah. Yeah, you're thinking. Your mindset's gone from I'm going to give this a go to, you know, oh I could be in I could be in Iraq. That's not a long period of time. Do you know what I mean? And you you come so far to the point where you know you're about to go and defend the country, so to speak. Yeah, it's mad. It's probably stupid, isn't it? It's probably naive to to, to not re- have realised that sooner. But again, yeah, I never ever joined the Marines to go to war yeah. or to fight for my country or to you know defend the Queen. I joined it because I wanted, you know, I was longing for that team, that you know, that camaraderie, that brotherhood, and and that's what I got. So, yeah, you could argue it was stupid, but I didn't ever think that far ahead to the likes of Iraq and Afghanistan. So yeah. when you started making friends with people and knowing people who were out there and were getting killed and stuff, that's when it becomes serious. And yeah, and that's when that's when obviously you do get much more of an invested interest in, in world affairs. Yeah, at this age though, you're you're very mature, aren't you, like mentally, because obviously you've gone through what we spoke about with your mum and you're going through marine training. Do you feel like a, <clears throat> do you feel like a man, do you know what I mean? Do you feel grown up or? Probably not, just looking back at some of the stupid things that <laughs> yeah. I did, like, you know, 18, 19. Um, yeah, I, I guess I am, yeah. yeah. Obviously I'm surrounded by a lot of older people all the time, so I obviously I'm a, a lot more mature than than probably 18 year olds at that time back back in Liverpool but I, I never ever felt like I was this mm. super mature kind of young lad I'm just comparing it to me because at 18 I was obviously playing footy and stuff and I was like the most timid sheltered kid ever and you've gone through so much and then you're about to you know head off to head off to war it's just a crazy comparison yeah. at 18 but I guess it's only us isn't it who look at back like that at 18 you don't think no. what are other 18 year olds doing I'll tell you what it gave me a lot of confidence yeah. like a lot of confidence um, yeah I was just so proud to be a Marine and I knew it was tough to get into so like physically I was like confident um, I was ugly as sin <laughs> but I thought I was like you know Leonardo DiCaprio you know I never ever was scared to chat to women and stuff like that like even like 18, 19 even though again I was you know, skinhead, big ears, spotty, you know. <laughs> so I was definitely confident and and what I noticed as well is I would never 
like I've never been a fighter, anything like that. And if anyone had maybe was want to fight before I joined the Marines, I'd tend to have walked away and avoided confrontation. And then after I kind of joined the Marines, even though there was no ardor or anything, there was something a bit about me was like, well, again, I won't look for a fight, but I don't mind you know, trying to stop it, yeah. And I've gone back the other way now. I think life's too short. I'd walk away again now. But there was definitely a couple of a couple of years in the Marines where just I was a lot more confident within myself. Mm. Um, so, yeah, possibly was a lot more mature than an eighteen-year-old. Although I didn't, I didn't feel that way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So obviously you do save. Obviously in war territory in Iraq and stuff. What's the first sort of assignment that you're given? Like where are you sent to? Yeah. So I went over to Iraq first and. There's nothing really to talk about from Iraq. It was a pretty chilled out time. It was, I was in a place called Um Gazar, that was on the Iraqi Kuwaiti border. It was our job to basically just coach, train, and mentor the Iraqi Marines and the Iraqi Navy. <clears throat> I was just really chilled out. It was literally like you know, we had sun lounges there. We had a volleyball court, a swimming pool. You had great food, great gym facilities. Um, it was just really, really chilled out. <clears throat> it's mad to think that you know you were in Iraq. Yeah, because I guess if you you know people at home like oh Andy's in Andy's in Iraq, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. And but like obviously the reality of it is not. Yeah, I made sure to tell me that it was super chilled out. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, I guess anyone else might have thought, oh God, you know, yeah. a couple of years ago he was in sixth form, now he's in Iraq. But yeah, it was really chilled out. Um, never had to fire my weapon once in anger. Was never in any real danger myself. Yeah, just super, super chill. What fascinates me, like when you saw when you know the Marines and that land, what's the obviously you're at a base, aren't you? But what's the hierarchy? Like, are you there with you know a wide range of you know soldiers, Marine, all different people, or like are you all together? Do you know is it this big sort of community? Yeah, you still got your like your, your rank structure, so yeah. however many people are there, yeah, you'll still have I think the highest rank on this particular base I was on was at um, a colour sergeant, and there's a few corporals, a few lance corporals, then loads of Marines. So you still have that kind of structure within wherever you are. Mm. And yet it was um it was like being on call in Iraq. So you'd had like the sergeant, it'd be in the ops room and he'd be there with I think the might have even just been one sergeant and a corporal. And they'd kind of be in charge of the ops room. And then the rest of us were all basically on radio watch. So you'd have like an hour on that radio, then an hour on that radio, then an hour on that radio, and then you'd be like a bit of a runner for an hour. It was like just four hours on, four hours off. Yeah. But just super chilled. Like it's it, like a job within this world, within a world sort of thing. Yeah, and it was just jobs like, you know, like man in the gate. If there was a visitor come, you'd have to come in, search them, pad them down. Because we'd, um, as a way to getting in with the locals and stuff, we'd hire local Iraqi contractors. Mm. So you'd, they'd come in the base every morning, you'd have to pat them down and stuff and and then just watch them, making sure they weren't doing nothing dodgy and then... Yeah, it, it wasn't all this like cool in the films and stuff. Yeah. But for me personally, anyway, it was super chilled out. So then, how long are you in that first sort of posting? Do I think four or five months in Iraq? I come home and just before Christmas, um, and then in January, I went out to Norway. Uh, but unfortunately, my granddad passed away um, when I was in Norway, so I didn't do the Norway trip. I was only there for a week or two. Come home, and I wouldn't have. I don't think would have been allowed if it weren't. Because you, I know it's your granddad, but it's like not a media type thing. But because my granddad had played such a massive role yeah. in my life, um, I was allowed to come home from Norway um, when he passed away. And then went back up to four or five. And then once the lads got back from Norway, the training then started for Afghanistan. And there was a six, seventh month kind of training regime going on until we then deployed in the like, kind of September time. So obviously, you know, we're talking about Iraq and stuff, and it's very sort of, you know, low, lower key, so to speak. When you go to this training for Afghanistan, do you understand that, you know, are people saying to you, this, this, this is different, you know what I mean? This is not yeah. going to be... <clears throat> yeah, we had lads who had obviously already been to Afghanistan and it was just like, you know, lads, you, you just need to be on the ball out there. Mm. So, yeah, in Iraq, it was, a, it was just a jolly, you know what I mean? It was a good few months of saving money, getting a suntan, and not massive, getting the gym. That was, that was Iraq. Afghan was going to be... Lads, there's a good chance that, you know, we're not all going to come home from this. Mm. You know, you hear stories of averages of, you know, one in one in five lads are getting blown up, you know, one in one in three lads are losing a limb. And you just... How do you comprehend that? Yeah. At, you know, 20 years of age, 19, 20, I think I was, getting told that, you know, your mates, one of your mates, you know, might not have an arm or a leg in, in six months' time. What's the mindset, like in the group do you know what I mean do, do you know do you sort of see people thinking 
not melt into the into the war, so to speak. But the you know, is the people who you know second guessing this, you know, don't really want to go there. I think maybe I never personally seen it, but I think maybe looking back now, probably fellas who were a bit older who had kids and stuff mm. were maybe a bit more reserved. Um, but I think all the young lads, it's that kind of macho thing, you know, like yeah. like the way we are with mental health. It's like ah, nothing's wrong with me. I never seen anyone like sh- shake away from from wanting to go to Afghanistan. Everyone was dead excited about it, but I definitely was scared. Do you mm. know? But again, I probably never shown it. Do you know what I mean? Twenty one, but I always remember a f- couple of months before we deployed, we had this this briefing of Marines who just got back from Afghanistan, and they um, they'd done a PowerPoint presentation all about IEDs, and an IED is an improvised explosive device, and they'd done, just done this PowerPoint presentation on how good the Taliban are at making them, how good they are at hiding them, how sophisticated they are, the places they are hiding them, you know, how big they can make them. And we just had this for like a day. And I remember it was on a Thursday or a Friday, I remember going home that weekend and just like broke down to me dad. And I was just like, fuck me, this is gonna be scary. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I was like, I'm gonna fucking die out there. Like, I just think getting told so much about mm. how they can kill you. It was like, fucking hell. And I just had a, like a bad feeling about it but obviously didn't tell anyone and I mm. don't know if any other lads would maybe say this, that they had the same thing but yeah for me I was I was definitely nervous about it I thought I was getting in, in, involved in the, uh, the Afghanistan chat oh, he said no but he's all like no but yeah so obviously then another thing that fascinates me is like the flight out like on the because that must be a crazy thing of like getting on this plane with you know, people that you've gone through training with or you've grown to know. And you must know in your mind that this plane might not be as full on the on the way home. Do you know what I mean? What I know you might not think of that. That's a scary thought. Yeah, I, d- I mean, I don't think I ever sat on a plane and thought, like, God, oh, you know, which one of my mates is kind of yeah. going to die. I think you've, you've got to try and blank that out as, you know, as much as you can. But, yeah, it was just a mad, but he, he, as stupid as it sounds, it was exciting as well. Do you know mm. what I mean? You were like, because you'd almost want to test yourself to see if you how will you react when you know you've got to do it for real so it was it was exciting as well in a weird way but yeah it is, it is mad being on a flight when you've got to put a helmet on you <laughs> sit, you're sitting on a flight with your helmet on and your body armor yeah that is mad um but again it was exciting as well you know you're packing all you're getting all your desert kit you're packing all that and again you just wanted to experience what you've mm. heard so many people talk about i think the naivety of your oh, age yeah. is just such a i don't know if it's a strength or a weak like you know I, I can't quite pinpoint what it is because like as you said fellas with kids and that you know if you were to be posted out now you would have such different thoughts to a kid who's going out pretty much like well you know what else have i got to do mm. sort of thing yeah you're right i don't know whether it is you know a strength of not knowing is better or just being you know I don't know but I, I definitely was naive and just was like ah, fuck it you know what I mean let's just go and yeah. was that the best mindset to have or not I don't know would I have worried sick if I'd known too much and I thought about it too much I don't know but yeah I was just a bit not, not blase I was obviously super professional but just in my own mindset apart from when I had that little wobble to my dad I just kind of blank it out and just yeah it's a bit of an adventure as well. It's crazy. Your dad, like, is he all, your dad's obviously supportive of what you're doing. But for him, you know, I know your dad now, obviously I'm lucky to know him, but it must be so difficult for him, do you know what I mean, for you to come home. I know he's a man's man, but be like, show him worries, but then, mm. you know, you've got to be posted out. You're going out there. It must yeah. be very, very difficult for him <clears> to sort of put away. Yeah, I mean, I always think when people are in the, in the military and stuff... Um, it's never hard for the person who's away, it's always the people who are left behind because you're just busy doing your job and it's the job that you've chosen to do and that you love. Whereas me, you know, my poor dad, he's seeing maybe I was a bit nervous about going and he's having to then just sit there and wait for the phone call, yeah. you know, of me saying I'm all right, I've, I've, li- I've arrived okay and stuff. So it must have been really hard for him to see me have my fears but then also try and be supportive and, you know, you're going to be all right, don't worry, mate. And so yeah, I think it's it's really tough on mm. the families who are left behind. Hundred percent, because as you said, you're in you're not in control of your of what's going to happen to you. You know, you're in a very dangerous place, but you've at least got some controllables over what goes on. Mm. Your your family don't have anything. Your family is sat and sat and bootle. You know, is someone going to ring today and say, you know, Haha, Andy's been blown up? Or is someone going to, is Andy going to ring and say, Dad, I'm fine? Do you know, that 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 can't be easy. I mean, I'm just trying to put myself in that position now. Yeah, and no one, you know. I've got my daughter now, knowing if she'd ever went away to the military, it'd fucking break my heart. Mm. You know, and 
and my dad's got two other kids to worry about as well and I'm out there in, in Afghanistan so it was yeah it was tough for him yeah really tough What a, so talk us through landing and like once you get there sort of do you immediately know this is different obviously you've been told but do you know now and hell this is different the couple of big memories I've got from first landing in Afghanistan was um, you get to Camp Bastion and you do kind of a couple of days just acclimatisation and then we had this big briefing and he was just giving you kind of information what's been going on in Afghanistan over the last few days and he said um, what the Taliban have been doing lately there's been a spike in suicide bombers so what they're trying to do is they're jumping in doorways that's how they're blowing themselves up so just be very mindful of doorways and they showed a picture of um, blue, this blue door and they said uh, for anyone who's going to uh, FOB incoming you know this this happened two days ago when three paras were killed and I'm sitting there going yep yeah, I'm going to FOB incoming fucking great mm. three lads were killed there two days ago and at that point I was like fuck me like this is real <laughs> this is real um, so that was my first memory of landing in Afghanistan and then the second vivid thing I have was when we got on the helicopter to fly to Fob Inkerman, where I was based. The helicopter lands, we all get our bergens and throw it out, make a bit of a pile. We all jump on it, on this pile, and there's just a line of paras to get on the helicopter that we've just got off. And they just looked like their souls had gone. They just looked so gaunt, you know. And the Marines and paras are very similar. You know, the boat, elite soldiers, you know, just great banter. It's like Liverpool and Man United. It's yeah. like, you know, just big hard men. And I was looked at these line of padders getting back on the helicopter. And I was just like, fuck me. Like, what have they seen in these last six months? They just looked so relieved to be getting on the helicopter. And the kind of excitement adventure I had of landing in Afghanistan and then seeing these line of padders getting on. And then there was a big fucking hole in the wall, in the base. I'm thinking, fuck me, where have we landed? Like, what what's going to await us now? And that, that was just, that was a bit a bit unnerving. Is there any sort of communication between you? Or do you, is it literally just, you're just seeing these, like, I guess, for want of a better phrase, soulless fellas, you know, yeah. looking quickly to get on? It's literally there, just we get off and, and they get on. So you don't speak to anyone or not. It's so loud with the helicopter, yeah, yeah, yeah. blades and stuff. But yeah, I just remember looking at them and they're just looking right through you. And I just thought, what have they seen? You know, I, I knew hmm. two, three days previous they'd lost a couple of lads in a suicide attack. And I was just just thinking, like, what, what what's gonna what's gonna what, yeah. what's gonna happen next? Is there any doubt in that? Obviously, you know, you're the, you're the elite fucking army member. Well, what? Is there any doubt are you ever like is there ever a point where you've like, what am I doing? Do you know what I mean? Nah, you know what, I think that's what the Marines were great at. We you know, we were all trained and we all had, you know, super trust in each other. Mm. I'm not saying everyone got on all the time, but there was never a time when I didn't um, didn't know that so and so had my back or they never knew um what well, the doubts that I've got there. So I was, was very fortunate to have great leaders. You it's know. special to have that though, because if you're landing in somewhere like that and there's still no doubt in who you're around, who you're with, mm. because for, I guess for a normal person it would be, you know, it's the quickest route for me to get out of here. Mm. But like you, you, you still to retain the the belief in the people that you're with, the Marines that you're with. That that I mean, it's testament to what they do and the training that they have. But yeah, that's not that's not a normal feeling, is it? But it was right the way through the whole team. I mean, I, I had a corporal, uh, Jimmy Carter. You know, uh, a big man clad, and you know, I'm a scouser. You think wouldn't get on? One of the greatest kind of. He was, a, he was a corporal, so he was above me. You know, he was a great role model, great leader. You know, t- trusted him massively. Um, come to like going going higher up the rank, we had a sergeant major, Spot Watson. Again, big big fella. You know, super switched on, being there, seeing it done. It got the t-shirt. You just looked at him and felt safe. Mm-hmm. You know, we had a boss, um, a major, Richard Parvin. Again, just super switched on fella. So, and then obviously the lads I was with. Do you know what I mean? We're all great lads as well. So, as scary as it was. I felt nah we're I'm mean, we're a good good yeah good good, good bunch of team a good bunch of lads here yeah. What's your how long are you due to be there for? Like once you six months. So yeah, due to come home. I think we got there in September October time, and then we'd be coming home what kind of April uh, sorry March time. Is it and when you're there, have you got certain sort of 
you know, is the missions or is it back to the, you know, day to day, you know, Andy, you're posted on this or? So the base for the objectives kind of thing where we were, where we were based about, I think about 10 kilometres, I think it was north of Sangin. And that's where all the kind of hearts and minds were going on in Sangin, DC, the district centre. And Fobinkerman was, like I say, maybe five, six miles up the road. And it was basically Fobinkerman's job to say, when all the Taliban wants to come down and try and, you know, infiltrate the town centre, we'd say, well, before you go that five, six miles down the road, come and have a fight with us instead mm. and let the kind of good work go on. So we were a bit of a blocker to kind of say, look, let's have a fight with us instead. So a lot of the times off our incoming, you were just going out poking the hornet's nest yeah. and just, you know, come on, let's have a fight instead. Is it, called, is it sort of you trying to be sort of, I don't know, a distraction technique, do you know what I mean, in terms of like leave them sort of innocent people but and like let's, let's have a sort of a war between us? I mean... Yeah, I suppose you could yeah describe it like that. I just think you know it'd be it'd be the case of you know, you know a lot of good works trying to go on in Liverpool city centre. Yeah. So, you know we're up in in Southport saying, you know, right come on, you know yeah imagine they're coming up from bloody you know, up north somewhere and then as they're on the way down, Fob Income was like in Southport and it's like right before you get to Liverpool come on let's have a fight with us. Yeah. That was the kind of idea of it. But obviously Sangin DC had its own. I mean, what the, what the hard thing is to, for people to realise about Afghanistan is just how big it is. So you can control one area and you can get on top of it, but the second you move on and try and control somewhere else, the Taliban just come back to that area. Yeah. Did you understand how big the Taliban was? In terms of, you know, I think because, you know, from my recollection, I think people see this Taliban as like, you know, this small sort of extremist group, but it's so vast, isn't it? Like this, mm. so, it's so big. Well, the, the scary thing is, is, you know, who is the Taliban? I mean, one minute it could be a farmer. Mm-hmm. He drops he drops his pitchfork and he picks up an AK forty seven. That's the hardest thing. You don't know who you fight. You know you who you're fighting against. So it was so difficult to know how many of them there were, where they were, where they were coming from because you're just going on intel and it's are they are they lying? Are they telling the truth? So it was. They definitely weren't this kind of little ragtag army that maybe, you know, mm. some people might think and anyone who'd been over in Afghanistan knew how clever they were and they knew how they could fight and and yeah, we very quickly kind of got to understand that. Was it gunfire from early on? Like, was you involved in sort of, as you say, action? Pretty much every single day you went out on patrol off Bob Inkerman, say 90% of the time, you came into some sort of contact with the enemy. Whether that was small arms, whether that was rockets, whether that was an IED, or whether it was them just taking pot shots at the base, something happened most days. Mm. So obviously we're getting to the point where you obviously you know have your incident. Do you see people with injuries before sort of yours occurs? Or yeah, we had a couple of lads who got who got blown up um, quite early on in the tour. Um, they both made you know full recoveries, and then. In the December, we had two lads who got injured. One lost a foot and one lost an arm and a leg. And I guess that at the time in Afghanistan, the first few weeks were like quite fun. You know, we were having firefights with them, but we were getting the better of them. And it was like, fucking yeah, come on, we're here for a fight and you know, we're going to give it to you. And then when lads started to get injured, not just from our base, but you heard from other parts of Afghanistan, other Marines that you knew mm-hmm. were getting injured and getting killed, that's when it stopped becoming fun. It was like, now nah, this is serious now people are getting hurt and people are dying yeah. and um, and I think that's when not that we no one was ever blase but it was kind of you'd go out and you'd have, have a firefight with the Taliban you'd win the firefight and it'd be like yeah great but then again when people start getting injured and killed who you know I turned it's like this is fucking shit now mm. you said you had a feeling it weren't going to be earlier you said you know you just had a feeling this weren't going to go right is that lingering with you still or no gone yeah I'd gone yeah, so I had no doubts. I didn't ever think I was gonna get, you know, injured or anything like that. But the funny thing that happened on the on the morning that I did get injured, uh, one of my best mates, Ryan, uh, and my other best mate, Ian, we were sitting having breakfast, and Ryan said that he had a nightmare that Ian had got blown up, and Ian said, "Oh, fucking cheers, mate, nice one." And lo and behold, a few hours later, that's what happened. Jesus Christ! So talk us through then. You know, from your record, how much do you remember of the day, the the incident, you know? I remember it all. I remember waking up and I remember kind of being buzzing because there was two patrols going out and one had to leave at, I think, 
three o'clock in the morning and wanted to leave at half four five and I was leaving at half four five so I was great I've got an extra two hours in bed whatever it was all my kit was packed and prepped ready to go wake up at half four to get ready I had Liverpool's fixtures like on the next to my bed and a picture of my mum I always used to kind of kiss the picture of my mum get myself good to go again it's pitch black but all my kit's ready good to go we start forming out the forming up the patrol and then start start moving out and it's just pitch black you know you can barely see your hand in front of your face Ian is leading the way and I'm the second man and we've been on patrol for about half an hour or so and yeah nothing had happened it's just you know me as the second man I'm trying to keep as close to Ian so that I'm just kind of eyes and ears so I can kind of help if he comes into trouble but you want to be further enough away that if he gets injured, you know, you both aren't going to get injured together. And Ian's got his metal detector on one hand and his rifle in the other. And he's just trying to find IEDs, you know, making sure he doesn't stand on one, which in itself is a, you know, a, a job I do not envy one bit. Yeah. Um, and yes, he, he's going along and you're jumping over a series of fields and irrigation ditches. And Ian turned to me and he said, Andy, we're going we're gonna to jump here. I said, mate, I'm right behind you, never you're good to go, you know, you just let me know. And he walks a little bit further and then, I remember I, I kind of slowed my pace down a bit because he was kind of looking to kind of see where he can jump over this ditch. I just slowed, slowed the pace down and he walked like back towards me a bit. I went, we'll go here. So I, um, I said, right, okay. Walk towards him and kind of steady myself, ready to run and jump. It, it wasn't like a really wide ditch, but it was you needed a bit of a... And um, yeah, he just walked back towards me, and he said, we'll go here. And he just kind of went to run and jump. And I've just went like that to jump next. And then I just heard two of the loudest bangs I've ever heard in my life. Just went... Doo -doo. And I just thought, fuck. And I just fell back and just started screaming as loud as I could. Because I knew it was pitch black and I didn't know whether I'd been blown 100 metres away or what. And um, I just started screaming as loud as I could. There wasn't any pain, but I knew I'd been blown up. And thankfully the guys on the patrol got to me as quickly as they could. And they started, you know, reassuring me straight away and saying, Andy, don't you know, we're all right. And, um, and that was it. Do you not know... Obviously, you're saying you're, you're conscious. Do you know you? Do you know you're banging like you're banging trouble? Do you, do you know you're really hurt? And do you understand what's happened to your, your mate in front of you? And do you, or are you just completely in the dark? For yeah, you? the first few seconds, I'm just you know screaming. I know I know I've been blown up, but I wasn't thinking of how injured I was or anything. I remember I just I couldn't. I didn't know my injuries, but I couldn't I couldn't move anything. You know, it turns out it's because I had 27 different injuries. I had shrapnel to my face, um, a broken sternum, broken elbow, a chunks missing out both forearms, I severed my femoral artery, which they say you can bleed to death within six minutes, chunk out my left eye, broke both lower legs, and I had nerve damage in both hands and both feet now. And thankfully the medic, a guy called James Smith, he uh, ran over and he placed a tourniquet on the top of my groin, which effectively saved my life. And but for the first 10 minutes, I didn't feel any pain. I was just in, in shock, you know, and I just kept on saying to the lads, you know, have I got my arms and legs? He said, yeah, Andy, don't worry. I said, lads, you know, don't lie to me. Have I got my arms and legs? And they're saying, yeah, Andy, don't worry. You know, you're fine. And I was just going, lads, don't fucking lie to me, you know. And because I, I knew what was going on and I, I knew voices, I knew who the lads were, but I had all the dirt and debris in my face. I was just lying there, I just couldn't see anything. And I was just... Kept on asking for reassurance. Obviously, the lads kept on reassuring me, and and they just done everything they could to, to keep me alive. Mate, the the feeling of like mortality, just ba like baffles me. Like, do you ever believe that you you, you know you're gonna die? You're, you're dead. No, I never ever thought in those forty minutes it took to get a helicopter out to me. I didn't ever think I was gonna die, and I think that again is down to the lads on Trust. the ground. You know. I had my sergeant major to come over, the guy I mentioned before, spot watching to see if I was okay. You know, he'd already got the helicopter coming in. I had, uh, you know, James Smith, the medic, he'd put a tourniquet on me, me mate Sharp, he was there, you know, reassuring me and the other guys. And 
again, maybe it was naive not to think that I was going to die, but I never ever thought I was going to die. Mate, the, the, what fascinates me, and you're lying injured, obviously, on the floor, these IEDs are, I guess, spotted around randomly. They just put them wherever they think you're going to be. Your mates or your teammates, fellow Marines, have ran in with absolutely no regard for mm. what they could stand on or what, what was what you've actually been hit by or whatever. They literally, their only thought is get to Andy and we'll make sure he survives. And not just me, you know, now they've got two lads to, yeah. to look after, so they had to get over the ditch, you know, so Ian's jumped over, being blown up, he's been blown forward and I've been blown back. So not only have the lads got to get to me, and I was kind of just like perched on the edge of the ditch type thing, they've got to get to Ian, who's been blown forward, you know, 10, 20, 30 metres. Yeah, so they've got so to keep they've going. they've got to get over the ditch that's rigged with IEDs and get to them quickly and then get him back over the ditch and on a stretcher. So, you know, me and Ian owe our lives to the lads on the ground that day because obviously they've done an amazing job. I mean, there's teams in the world, and there's teams in every office in the land, but, I mean, there's not many people who would, you know, it, it quite easy for someone to go, like, to back out in that position, do you know what I mean? And, like, someone else will deal with it, but it sounds like every one of them, all their only thought was to make sure you two lads were... And it's, it's a mad, isn't it? Because not only have you got to be you know technically good you know putting a tourniquet on yeah. making sure it's done right but it's fucking hard you're carrying your own kit and you're carrying all my kit and a stretcher you know you're carrying you know f- a f- you know, 13 stone fella um, all his kit and stuff and you've got to be good at what you're doing as well yeah. and there's IDs everywhere and people are you know potentially going to be shooting at you any minute and not be emotional not like yeah. you know for them it's you know where it continues with your life hanging in the balance I found out weeks later a, a friend of mine, Mick Cagle, his name was. He, um, when the bomb went off, he was in a, he was in another position, and um, he had to kind of basically. Um, I think when the helicopter come in, he had to was basically making sure no enemy was going to come. And like months later or years later, he he just said he was just lying there, just looking out, crying because he he knew, yeah, you know, me and Ian had been blown up, and. He's, he's still on the ground. I've got to do his job mm. still. I mean, I mean, that's what that's what fascinates me. I mean, you're you're a friend of mine, but you know, Marines. We spoke to one on the podcast as well. You you do you do you know fascinate me, but you're still human. You know, you're still a human fella with emotions and like anyone who sees that. I mean, that's why I guess PTSD and stuff like that. But anyone who sees something like that to still have, you know, the presence of mind to stay on job. Yeah. That I mean, I know anyone can try and get in the Marines, but I guess that's why only a few people make it through. Yeah, not even that just day though. You've got to then do it again and again for possibly the next six months. Mm. It's, it's yeah, it's mad. But again, I never ever, I never ever thought I was I was gonna die. And it is down to that team. I remember just there was a point at the end where I'd lost a lot of blood at that, this point, and the guys had done everything they could for me. And it was just a case of waiting for the helicopter to come in and pick me up. And I remember lying there and I was freezing because the lads had just cut all my clothes off me to get to all my injuries. And I was like, lads, I'm freezing. And they're like, I know, we fucking, you're naked. Like, that's why. And it's weird, isn't it? Because it, I was cold and I was getting a bit sleepy. And I'm obviously I was close to dying. And the lads are saying to me, like, come on, you know, Ah, you won't be playing footy again anytime soon, will you? You fucking yeah. you scouse bastard. Ah, Liverpool is still shite, and you know. And I'm like, oh, very funny. And they're like, right, come on, what him, you know? And you could, I could see or well, hear lads just trying to talk to me to keep me talking. And I was just getting to a point where I was just like, yeah, very funny. Yeah, okay, yeah, ha-ha. come on, Andy, keep. And I'm, hmm. I didn't, you know, didn't see a shine, a light, and say no, step into the light, nothing like that. But I just felt really sleepy, and, and then the next thing I heard was an Apache helicopter, and the Apache helicopters kind of come with the Chinook as protection, and I could hear the um, one of the lads said, right, Andy, there's the Apaches, the Chinook will be here any minute, and then I heard just the two rotor blades from from the um, the Chinook, and I thought, oh, just stay, you know, stay awake for this helicopter to come in. Because the kind of unwritten rule is if you're still breathing when you get put on the helicopter, the chances are you'll survive. Yeah. I remember the lads picking the stretcher up, put me on the back of the Chinook, and I just remember thinking, ah, I'm fucking... Got a chance. Got a chance here. What point, you know, you're saying you're not feeling pain when you're on the ground and 
you know, you feel okay. When does that change? When do you like? When do you? Is it the flight back? When? No, after the after like ten minutes, there was like ten minutes of I didn't really feel pain, and then the most excruciating pain I've ever felt in my right thigh, uh, where the tourniquet had been placed. It just felt like someone had like, you know, maybe when you're a kid, like your dad like grabs your thigh and squeezes it. Yeah. It just felt like that, but it felt like my thigh was in a vice, and uh, it was like. You know, sometimes you get like a really dull, dull throb and pain. You get like sharp pain. It was like both of them at the same time, and it was like you couldn't almost breathe with it. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, it was fucking painful. Are you taking straight? Sorry for my naivety, but are you taking straight to a hospital? Hospital? Are you taking straight to the UK or? Yeah, so I got flown straight to Camp Bastion, and at that point, that's when I, as soon as I got put on the helicopter, my memory goes. Then I was flown straight into Camp Bastion. I had two life-saving operations performed on me and then the condition was deemed that serious that they needed to get me straight back to the UK. Um, so they put me into a, a two-week induced coma and um, the next thing I know is I, I wake up two weeks later back in the UK. Mate, what is waking up? I, I know your me- memory might not be spot on there, but what is waking up after that? Do you, know, like, do you still remember being on the ground in, you know, in, in the field, as we called it, or...? What is yeah. that like? I remember um, being in the intensive care ward and from what I remember anyway was I wake, waking up and my dad was um, my dad was just walking towards me and I, uh, I am emotional now. I just uh, I just started crying. Like I knew I'd been blown up and when he was walking towards me I just got a big lump in my throat and um, just gave him a big hug and then... Um, yeah, we both were just crying for ages, lad. Just felt like just hugged him and squeezed him for about half an hour. I mean, you know, we spoke about your dad earlier and how tough it would have been for him to let you go, but, mm. you know, you've been brought back and sort of, you know, you're in an induced coma. For him, you know, he's obviously had this phone call and then he's had to go down to where you are and stuff like that. I mean, that must have been for him and you as well, you know, massive overwhelming fucking emotion. That's the one. That's the one thing I feel guilty on because you know for two weeks he's just sat and you know and he's not like a an emotional father and he's quite an old school father. So for him for two weeks to just sit there and just watch me in a coma, mm. do you know what I mean? Like what what you do to watch your child in a coma for two weeks? Not you know especially what sort of he's been through and sort of like it must have sort of felt a bit full circle for him. Do you know what I mean? Like. Well, why in the space of what seven years he's he's lost his wife to leukemia and now his son's just been blown mm. up lying there with a, you know tubes going, you know, in my mouth and my nose, they um, you know needles and yeah. tubes coming out of my arms and like bandaged head to toe. You know what my dad's been through. You know I always joke and call him a you know a miserable ass and stuff, but my dad's had a proper properly hard life. Do you know, he's seen so, like you know he's experienced some mm. stuff and. You know, thankfully this time you wake up and you know you, you might you're in a bad way, but you wake up. Mm. At what point does someone explain to you the injuries you've suffered, and you know, is it a case of a doctor coming in and saying, you know, right, Andy, you've, as you say, you got chunks out your arms, you got this stuff in your face. How how is that broken down to you on a bed that you've suffered all these injuries? So initially, I just had this big big cage on my leg, and the idea was they were going to try and grow six centimetres of bone back in my leg because it was all damaged and an amputation or to try and grow the leg back was the the options on the card so it sounds stupid but and maybe this is just my memory maybe it was different but from what I remember everything was just bandaged and they didn't go through and say oh you're going to have this scar here that scar there I woke up and I just had um, all my thighs were red raw because they took skin grafts from all around my thighs and you know done everything but the idea was everything was going to heal alright the, the big focus was on my right lower leg so I was just going into operations every few days to try and you know save this save my right leg so there was never really a time that they sat down they gave me like an overview and they said look you've broken your elbow but it'll be fine and you're going to have a little scar here but you know it'll be fine the big thing was always my right lower leg and then it was just like that. I was in, I was in an induced, uh, sorry, I was in intensive care for a couple of weeks, and then the biggest thing, which was the hardest thing for me to take, was, I was lying in the bed, and you um, 
I remember putting my hands like under the blankets and I felt a bit of shrapnel in, in my ball bag. And um, I remember saying to the nurse, I said, oh, I think um, when they've done the operation, they've not maybe done, done it, like they've missed a bit basically or something. And I was thinking, I don't want this bit of metal to like float round my ball bag or whatever and, and cause any more damage or something. And the nurse said, oh, I'll go and talk to one of the doctors. And then this doctor come back. He could walk past me and I wouldn't know what he looked like or anything. And he just said, I'm really sorry, Andrew, to tell you this, but um, you've actually lost both testicles in a blast. And I said, nah, I, I can't have, but, but because everything was so swollen, my whole body was just... You know, I was like, really? What? I said, and, and he was just like, yeah, unfortunately, you know, they were, they were damaged and they had to be removed. And I, I just started crying my eyes out. But this was like maybe like eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night, so visit and I was over. My dad had been in all day. And then my dad had to come back in and um, and just sit with me. But, but the worst bit is, you can't reassure someone. It's not like it's not like he can say, oh, it'll be okay, because it, it, it won't be. Mm. Like, it, it won't. This is not like you've broke your leg, it, you put a cast on it, it'll be all right. You know, it's not like you've, you've lost a tooth, we can get you a fake. It's like you, you can't have kids. You know, you, any any visions of, of you having, you know, children, of running in the park, gone. Mm. So straight away, just that idea of I can't have kids was just, was just absolutely heartbreaking. And But then, as heartbreaking as that is, then I'm, I'm a 20-year-old fella. I'm thinking, how do I get a bed? Like... Hmm. What bird's gonna? How how do I one day go up to a girl in a bar and say, oh, by the way, I'm Andy, da da da, all this. Oh, by the way, I've got no balls. Hmm. I think a, a women it like is that a thing for women? How do I tell? How do I fall in love with a woman with a woman who knows I can't have kids? You know how how do I? Does, does everything still work? Okay, all these things are going through in your head at twenty years of 20, age. Yeah. I mean, like, does every other injury that you've got? Not pale into insignificance, but are you then like, does it go from I'm injured to like, my fucking life here now? Do you yeah, know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It, the scars on my arms and the on my right leg was just like, these are all things that will heal. Yeah. But being told that I can't have kids, like, where does my life go from here? And that, that's the thing that hurt me more than anything. And mm. that I was so... I didn't tell anyone for years and years and years and years. Um, because it just, it just broke my heart. Mm. Like, absolutely destroyed me. Um, thankfully, you know... As, as everything does work normally now. I'm essentially just firing blanks. Everything works <laughs> exactly the same now. And thankfully, women, thank God... Don't mind you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, unless there's the odd few who've got a ball fetish or something maybe <laughs> I don't know which I've not come across but thankfully it hasn't bothered me it, mm. it hasn't affected me in any way like sex life with girlfriends and things like that Um, but yeah at the time they're getting told that I mean it was hey, the one thing that jumps out to me is the confusion that you must have had because like you're lying in a hospital bed in intensive care and obviously your dad's there to try and reassure you and tell you everything's going to be okay but are you not looking at your body thinking like fuck it, I'm twenty years old. Do you know what I mean? Like, how do I? I'm not saying you doubted the fact that you would bounce back from it, but did you? There must have been a point where you're like, you know, overwhelmed, so to speak. You know what? It all just seemed to happen so quick, and I was, you know, it was it was just so busy. I didn't really have time to dwell on it. You mm. know, I was getting operations performed on me most days. I had, you know, people coming in to see me every day, surrounded by like other injured soldiers. And it was just something happening all the time, which was good. I didn't really have time to sit there and think, oh, fucking hell. So it's just something was going on all the time. And then before I knew it, I was getting moved up onto the ward, which meant I was recovering. And then it, don't get me wrong, I had 100% had down moments, you know what mm. I mean? But it just seemed to be that busy. There was just something always going on. And then I was getting better bit by bit. And then, like, little things, that's why I've got such a maybe unique way of life now, because it just becomes so grateful for little things. Yeah. You know, when, when when I could get him in my wheelchair for the first time and my, and my dad could take me down the pub, it was like, wow, what a day. He said, wow. Do you know what I mean? I'm in a wheelchair, get in, yes. Yeah. You know, if anyone would think at 20 years of age, if you want to be in a wheelchair, you'd tell to fuck off. Yeah. 
I was like, get in. When so obviously you were trying to grow your leg, sort of grow the bone in your leg to give you two legs and what people would essentially call a normal life mm. with the other injuries. At what point is this not working or, you know, is it not what they thought it would be or you're not happy? So the idea was, yeah, I'd, I'd have this big cage on called an Elizabeth frame and it went from my knee to my ankle. They'd break my leg in a separate position and put two rods in the bone, give me a couple of spanners and every day I'd turn these spanners and pull the bone apart in my leg. And I, t- I tried, <clears throat> tried to go with that for about 15 months. And to be fair, it worked great. Do you know what I mean? It was it done it's done its job. I had to wear this horrendous cage on the leg, but once the cage got taken off, there was so much nerve damage to the foot. You know, I couldn't wiggle my toes, I couldn't move my ankle. It was just a dead weight essentially. And I remember going on a trip to uh, Bavaria on like an adventure training trip with a load of other under injured marines. And my mate Johnny, who had a prosthetic leg, he'd been blown up, lost an arm and a leg. And his prosthetic was above the knee. And I said, if I could, if you could have my bad leg and swap it for your prosthetic, would you? And he said, not a fucking chance. Mm. And I'm thinking, God, you've you've got a prosthetic and you wouldn't even swap your prosthetic for my for my leg. I was like, my leg must be fucked. And although I was saying how grateful I was to still be alive and to be able to walk and do things, I, ve- I started like seeing other injured soldiers, you know, with prosthetics get on with their life and running and skiing and surfing and skydiving and and yet I had this leg there I was always having to explain to people and it was just like if some said oh what have you done to your leg I'd be like oh well it was broke but it's not now but now I'm trying to grow it back and it's the it was just and one day I'd wake up it'd be all right the next day it'd be fucked and I couldn't do anything and I was just in this indecisive moment in my life where I didn't know whether I was coming or going. And at the same time, I was surrounded by some amazing, inspiring soldiers who had moved on with their life with a prosthetic. And I just thought, there's got to be more to life than this. Did it, did it come from like a, you know, a well-intended way of improving your life to something that was, I guess, limiting your life? In terms of, you know, was, did you sort of feel like, I'm going to be carrying this leg around with me for yeah. the rest of my days? Yeah, I thought, yeah, I can't, I can't. I can't walk around like this for the rest of my life. Do you know what I mean? It was it was a struggle. I was taking a lot of painkillers. Again, I didn't know whether I was coming or going. And I thought to myself, if I'm going to learn how to be an amputee, I'd rather do it now when I'm young than leave the Marines and then get to 40 and think, ah, oh, fuck this. Yeah. I'd rather learn to be good at a prosthetic leg earlier on. So it, it was a few things, but it was such a hard time in my life, you know, to... To choose to have it amputated, it was it was massive because trying to say to my dad as well, that my dad was just like, mate, just be grateful you're still alive. Who gives a fuck yeah. if you can't run? And I was like, but I care. I want to be able to run. So having to sit down and have that conversation with my dad was quite difficult. I um, but once I decided to have it done, he was you know all on board, support me, and listen. I think I think, like in life, though, it happens a lot, doesn't it? You know, you need to. Sometimes in life you need to be courageous and, and like make a decision. And after the motivational talks, I do talk a lot about this. And it's like, it could be you're in a you could be you're in a toxic relationship, and you just need to be strong and make a decision. And it's it's done. It's done. It could be your job. You know, you need you hate your job. You need to move away from it. I needed to make this decision to have me leg amputated because it was just rumbling on and nothing was changing. I seen a Tom Hardy thing once, and he's talking about when he in his role for Bronson. And he tells the story that, um, you know, Charlie Bronson rings him up or something and tells the story about a kid who got his got his leg caught in a, in a grid or his arm caught in a grid and there was a flood and the water keeps rising and rising and uh, they can't get this kid's arm off and out, out the grid and the kid dies. And this Charlie Bronson says to Tom Hardy, he says, you know, that wouldn't have happened to me because I would have, I would have said to them, cut it off. And he says, like, in life, sometimes you need to cut a little bit of yourself off mm. in order to grow. And I just think it's so true. I mean, yeah. Charlie Bronson, of all people, to say it, like, <laughs> quite, a, quite a wise thing to say, but that was me. I needed to literally chop a part of me off yeah. to grow be, because it was, yeah. my life was just going nowhere. I think you coming into... I don't know whether you thought like this at the time, but it certainly feels like that to me. It's like a control thing as well because, obviously, now 
you know, I'm sure the Marines looked after you, but you, you're no longer a serving Marine. Mm. You know, you've now got, you've been given these injuries, told to live with them. Is there an element of control in it in terms of, you know, you know if I take this this leg off, I'm in control of what happens. It, it's, mm. it's back to me, do you know what I mean? It's not, I'm not told, oh, your leg might, might the bowl might get stronger, do you know what I mean? You're walking around with it. It's back to you making a decision that's going to impact your life. You're in control. Yeah, big time. I think one of the main reasons what upset me so much was, you know, I'd make plans and I think, right, I want to go here today. And then on that day, my leg would be really sore and I couldn't, I'd have to cancel the plans. And then the next day, my leg would be great. And then the next day, it'd be shit again. And the next day, it'd be all right. And I, I did have no control on how my leg would feel. And I knew from knowing other amputees that once I'd got used to the prosthetic, the chances are I'd be all right most of the time. Mm. So there definitely was an element of taking control back of my life. And although, listen, it was probably the biggest decision I'll ever have to make, but it was um, ultimately the right one. Yeah. So what's the process then of, obviously you sit down, it's an option for you, but you sit down and you tell your dad that, you know, this is what I want to do. How does it come about to get into the operation? The operation? Yeah, so I got in touch with a good friend of mine. Uh, his name is uh, Commander Anthony, to- uh, Commander to- Tony Lambert. And we we met in Iraq and we've been good friends and we kept in touch and he comes to visit me after I got injured and he'd been a great, you know, support to me. And he happens to be a fantastic surgeon. So I just kind of rang him up and said, Doc, I want you to amputate me with my leg. And he just thought, that, he said, I knew you'd say that one day. And um, yeah, we went for a beer <laughs> in London and um, it was so funny actually, a really funny story from it. We, me, so the Royal Marines, it would have been round about this time actually, like end of October time, because the Royal Marines, uh, 28th of October, it's the Royal Marines birthday. Yeah. I think it was 350 years it was, they had a big celebration in London. So the doc said, why don't you just come down to London, you and your dad, we'll go to dinner, but we'll go for a little bit of a pub lunch in the day and we can talk about the operation. I said, right, okay, so we went down. I just booked a little shitty hotel in London, being a cheapskate, and it was a double bed and a single. And my dad was a bit like, because he's non, non-military, he was a bit like, fucking hell, God, I'm going to share a bed with you. So anyway, the doc was there, and I'm in the double bed. We go to this big gala dinner thing, and loads of Marines there I've not seen for years, and get to about one o'clock in the morning or midnight, whatever, and one of the sergeants say to all of these lads, right, lads, the minibus is going back now. You know, to Plymouth, I think they were going. So you'd either get on the minibus now or you sort yourself out tonight, whatever you're doing. And a few of the boys were like, have you just got a hotel? I said, yeah, yeah, I got a hotel. They were like, ah, fuck, we'll just come and kip in yours. I was like, sounds okay. So the night continues. And we end up in string fellows, I think. Oh, so it's a funny, funny night. Um, get home at like four in the morning. Back to this little Russian crack den hotel. <laughs> and my dad's bladdered smoking his rollies and there's the dock there and four of the marines and uh, they they go up to the hotel and my dad's having a ciggy outside I said dad come and get into bed now because the lads are getting the bed and my dad's going I'm kind of, it's my bed I'm fucking getting in it I said the lads will just get in the bed so hurry up and come and get in it so anyway by the time we get up there's three of the lads in, in the uh, sorry two of the lads in the double bed and two of the lads in the single. So I just get in, get unchanged, just to my boxes and jump in the double bed. So now there's three of us in the double bed. My dad walks in and he's like, what the <laughs> fuck's going on here? I'm like, get out of my bed. I was like, dad, just get in here. He's like, I'm not fucking letting you spoon me. And I'm like, well, what do you want to do? And so for that night, there's four of us in this double bed and two lads in the single. And um, he's just spooning my dad. And my dad's like, this is fucking gay. This is so, so funny. Um, so that was the day I decided to kind of have my leg amputated. And then a month later, 25th of November, 25th of November um, was, was the date I had it done. I know you say the doc said to you, you think he said he thought you'd say that. Had he advised you to to do it earlier or did he just sort of left you to... He, yeah, uh, he kind of, he would never have advised me and told me, but he thought it would have been best to get it done straight away just because he knew this day had come. Mm. But he never ever said to me, like, you know, if I was you, I'd do this. Um, he just tried to be dead diplomatic over it but he was one of the only people who said 
you had to get it done straight away. Mm, so important to have people like, obviously, you know, you end up making that decision, but it's important to have people like that in, in I guess, in situations like that who, you know, you say that to him and he gives you positive reinforcement back in terms of you making the, you know, I've seen you making the right decision. Yeah. I'm sure you did that validate the, the whole thing for you. Hundred percent, yeah. He said to me once. He said, you know, that that leg you would only ever been able to live life at snail's pace, and you know, snail's pace isn't for you. So he knew me. It's not like a, just a random surgeon saying, "Oh, I can do a good job there." He knew that, you know, he'd be able to I'd do a good job of amputating the leg. But he knew me personally mm. that it would be the right thing for me. I think that was hard for him to do the yeah. operation on you. Imagine, imagine the pressure that you know. Yeah. If things don't go right, he's amputated his mate's leg, and yeah. now I may be wheelchair bound or something. Because I always think with like, I guess with doctors, <laughs> this sounds terrible, but an operation's a job, isn't it? Mm. You know, you don't know the person. They're on your table. You do your best for them, and you move on. Mm. For him, it must have been very difficult to put someone on that table who he knows, cares about, goes drinking and you know celebrating with, and now he's got to do this. That's gonna essentially shape where your life goes. Yeah, like such a. Mark of, of the man, you know, mm. he's an absolutely unbelievable fella. Um, all the time in the world for him, I love him to bits. And he just happens to be really good at his job. And the fact he could, he, you know, he's still done it for me despite the pressures of, you know, being his mate and all that. It just says so much about him, doesn't mm. it? That's, I mean, it's an incredible thing because he's giving me life back. Yeah, I said that's exact. That's pretty much the point I'm trying to get. I mean, it's obviously rewarding for him to have mm. a friend in you, and he knows he's played a, such a big part in your life. I'm sure he's oh, very humble with it, but like that's it. We talk, we spoke about pressure a lot in this mm. podcast. That's no, that's, that's a different level of pressure because if it goes wrong, it, you know, it's not, it's not your finger. You know, the thing is, he, I said, did it all go all right? He was like, yeah, fine, as expected. I was it, very like understated, low key, humble. And then his mate come in, because he got his mate to help him. And his mate come in like hours later, and I was like, and he went, fuck me, that leg. Oh my, and I went, what do you mean? He said, that was, that was a messed up leg. But the doc had made it sound like it was just running the mill. Easy, yeah. You know, just did nothing to worry about when as expected. But his mate who helped him was like, that leg was fucking, was fucked. Because I guess what people don't understand is obviously once the leg comes off, there's, you know, all sorts of bone and veins and stuff that link you can... up arteries and you, whatever you do, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, it's that like that's proper high pressured sewing. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. it's, it's like a patchwork. Yeah, right? but I mean, do you remember? Yeah, you know, we spoke about waking up from the from the IED. Do you remember waking up and mm. what's the feeling like of waking up with one mm, half leg? I remember waking up from the operation and I felt like the weight of the world had been lifted. I remember lifting my leg up and it, it went up dead quick because obviously there was no weight yeah, at the yeah, end of yeah. it. So I felt like weightless within my leg, but I also felt weightless of just, I felt like I could breathe again. Emotionally. Because, yeah, because of just those those months of should I, shouldn't I, should I keep it, should I take it off? It, it was done now. The decision mm. was done, move on with my life. And to kind of just put that chapter to bed was just like, oh, fuck for that. Yeah. So, yeah, just a massive you know, release of what was when I woke up. But I think getting the, you know, this is just my personal opinion, but I think that day is when your life takes off because your mindset of, I'm living at Snail's Place, I can never go skiing, these people can do things well better than me, oh, how am I going to, I'm going to have to cancel my plans to, mm. yes, my legs off, but my, my options are limitless now. Mm. I can go and live my life as a, how old are you, 21, 20? 20, uh, 22 now. 22 but the, you're like you know you can go and you've got your whole life ahead of you yeah. yes it's it's different to what other people but as you were saying anyway you're different you've always been different yeah yeah no 100% there was obviously the that, that's where the, the tattoo story came about as well which was funny that you'll never walk and yeah. from that moment on I think just looking at even the humour of that with it and then exactly what you said that's when I was like right okay the world is my oyster now like hmm. let's let's go and live my life and um, it, it was like that it literally went the opposite of snail's pace I was here there and everywhere I was learning to walk again learning to run I was down in Headley Court uh, the rehabilitation centre I'd met a girl at the time um, she moved up to Liverpool and two stepchildren and I was just here there and everywhere just like living living my best life it was it was great and it was just such a far cry from being you know in wheelchairs not being able to walk and not knowing whether I was coming or going 
my life was just like I'm back to being normal. Mm. Whatever normal is, I'm having a go at it. Like, yeah. Obviously, you're medically discharged from the Marines, and you know you get whatever comes with that. But do you ever struggle with that in terms of you know not being, not being a Marine by name, like or being what people call an ex Marine or former Marine or a Marine that got blew up? Do you struggle with that? Yeah, massively. Yeah, there was definitely you know a couple of couple of years really where. I mean, it was great at the start when I had my leg amputated and it was all, you know, because it was all exciting again, you know, learning to walk again, learning to run and learning to ski, learning to surf, and it was it was great. But then when the medical discharge comes, you realise as well, I can't just stay in this, like, military loop of, you know, learning how to ski, learning how to surf and going on these, like, military gala dinners and stuff and doing stuff at military charities, you know. At some point, you know, got to move on with your life. And that's what that's what I found really tough, and that's when I kind of started. I mean, I needed to distance myself away from the military because I wasn't a marine anymore. But at the same time, I was distancing myself away from the military, which I had to. But I wasn't. I wasn't getting into anything good, hmm. in the sense you know I didn't have I didn't have a purpose. You know, so when that medical discharge comes and I kind of distance myself away from any military charity kind of work and stuff. It's like, well, what, what am I gonna do? Is it an identity thing? Like, because obviously, you know, you. I guess when you were coming home from your tours and stuff, it was always Sandy there. Mm. You know, he's he's a marine. He's just being in Iraq. He's just he's going to Afghanistan. Do you have a yeah, an identity th- crisis? But do you have an identity sort of? I think we said that on a podcast with Tasha. You know, I got a Royal Marines commando tattoo on my arm because I was so proud of being in, in the Marines. And you know, when someone asked you what you did for a living, saying you were a Royal Marine commando was amazing. So then to suddenly then not have that mm. was a proper identity crisis, yeah. And then also you've got this kind of weird thing where, again, you don't fit in anymore because I'm back in Liverpool, but all my mates have got nine to fives, so, you know, whatever, doing their thing. And yet I've not got a nine to five, I've been pensioned off. So it, it means it's not a lot of money, but it means I don't have to work a nine to five. So then what you do during the day? Mm. It's like, and then when you're going for a beer, you don't have to get off for work the next morning, so you might have a few more beers than maybe you should. Um, I know I've got money coming in every month, no matter what I do, so I, I gamble, and I can gamble probably more than I should. And um, Yeah, like my relationship then starts to break down um, with my partner, and through that kind of leaving the Marines, that identity crisis of just not, not really knowing who I am anymore, and where I am and where I'm going, a lot of things just started to spiral out of control, really. Mm. I think it's like from me outside looking in, you have this high of my life's back in control, you know, I'm, I'm back, I can do this, I can do that, my life's endless, uh, limitless to the barren reality of life of right, I'm back in bootle, mm. um, you know, what's on TV? Uh, do you want to come out for a drink? No, lad, I'm in work. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's coming back to because all your life, all your adult life, you've not lived a normal life you've been in the marines you've been in war zones and all this is is that sort of settling into civilian ways of doing things difficult that is that has been the most difficult thing ever you think about my whole life you know my mum dies at 12 i joined the marines at 17 i'm in iraq at 18 i'm in afghanistan at 19 get blown up at 20 go through a year recovery at 21 have my leg amputated at 22 learn to walk and run 24 25 I'm learning to ski, learning to surf, I'm travelling the world, part of like this military charity stuff, you know. And then once that stops, what I, I don't get joy out of sitting there watching the TV. Mm. I've had massive things happen to me all throughout my life. So when it comes to just waking up, walking the dog, and then sitting back at home, yeah. what the fuck? Like that's that does not, that's not gonna excite me. I've had crazy things happen to me all throughout my life. So adjusting to a normal life mm. was really, really difficult, and hence why then like the gambling got bad at a point. Hence why like the drinking and the kind of going out on crazy benders and and, and doing things which, which you know, yeah, just a regret. Mm. Now looking back, it was just stupid and silly, but it was because you're just chasing a high. Yeah, do you know what I mean? I think you've you've got a very unique high as well in terms of you can never replicate what you did for a job. No. Do you know what I mean? I, I guess, you know, football is to go with that and athletes and stuff, but, you know, you can't go down somewhere and just, like, replicate a war zone. No. Do you know what I mean? It, it just doesn't happen. It was... 
but, but I don't get I don't know what the answer is to that don't yeah. you know what I mean like you for someone who's, who's been like lost lost a parent at a young age being blown up in Afghanistan I mean ha- you just gotta get what I've tried to get better with it which I'm not perfect at now but just try to get comfortable in like the little things in life mm. do you know what I mean because you, like you say you, how can you represent replicate going back to Afghanistan and yeah. I think at a time that's what like what the gambling was you know what I mean it was it was a it was fucking hell this is this is big money this do you know what I mean just trying to replicate some sort of I don't know some sort of excitement because yeah. normal life just We're wasn't doing, doing it. it for me there's two parts that like in fact there's loads of parts of your life I'm fascinated with afterwards um, but obviously the biggest one is we spoke about you not being able to have kids you have obviously got an amazing beautiful little daughter how's that sort of talk us through that how does it happen yeah so my partner uh, at the time um, had two stepchildren and then we went down the route of, of IVF and um, yeah she, she was keen to, to go for it uh, as I was obviously and um, I just felt like I needed to kind of give it a go even though like I loved the, the stepchildren um, who were in my life I was just like I need to um, I need to feel like I've got I've brought something into the world as well so I uh, went to the doctors made an appointment explained the situation and stuff and then obviously because the problem with why we couldn't have kids was obvious as, as in I can't produce um, like you know sperm in that way just say well okay well you need to go for a sperm donor you go down that route and you just they match you up with someone who looks like you characteristics and stuff and you get options and pick the option and touch wood it's not really a, a crazy story when it comes to IVF it all just it all just worked first time mm-hmm. you know amazingly you're just so fortunate so lucky with it all just, all just worked out perfect um, my partner was amazing just went through it all like so amazingly and yeah, found out we were going to be having a little girl. Had the name sorted, like the room prepped, everything sorted. And then on the uh, yeah, 14th of October, goes in and that for me was just like the best day of my life. Mm. Just because, you know, being told that you can't be a dad and then obviously you know yourself, you've got two kids and I remember being at the top, um, you know, holding in my partner's hand and then you just hear the cry for the first time. <laughs> burst out crying like mm. thinking you know I've known for years that you know I can't be a dad and now there's this little thing crying who, who's all mine mm. you know and then you know 10 minutes later I'm holding and giving her a bottle and it was just the best feeling in the world to know that you know 6, 7, 8 years before I'm being told you know you'll never be a dad and yet there I am holding this little girl mm. I just brought loads of memories back to my mum, you know, because I always like longing to have that family and stuff. And now I'm looking there and I've got this little baby girl who I just think I want to just protect and hold and love forever. And it was just great how it all come full circle, do you know what I mean? It was yeah. just like, just, yeah, the best ever. I mean, anyone who knows what it's like to have children, like when you do all of them, it's like, you know, mm. the world can just get to fuck for want of a better phrase, like nothing else matters. For you though, to be, t- you know, someone look you dead in the eye and say, you're not having kids mm. that must have just you know what I felt and what other people have felt times a hundred because I guess you've defeated all odds really I mean I know IVF's an amazing it's an amazing amazing thing that's completed many many families but like what it, can you ever bottle that feeling up again like no I don't think so I mean it's yeah it was the greatest greatest feeling ever the greatest noise ever of um, you know her crying for the first time Um no, and I always used to think I wanted a big family. Mm. And who knows, maybe I will one day, I don't know, but she just completes everything. Do you know what yeah. I mean? To get told that you can't have something and then you get it. Um just just feel so grateful. And that's what I mean. I have a bit of a unique like look on life because like, life life's mad, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? And I just think I just feel so fortunate to have the things that I've got in my life. Do you know mm. what I mean? I don't kinda want for much and just got me little girl and that's me, me world and she's me world because of the years of you know the years of nights where I've you know so upset crying myself to sleep thinking I'll never be able to have kids so then to get her and for her to you know she's seven now and turn into the little girl she is and just to watch that and be there for it it's just it's the 
best feeling in the world. Yeah, you? I mean, and I can vouch she is a fucking diamond. She's <laughs> she's brilliant. But and obviously this fella who's asleep next to us for people who are who are watching. Yeah. In terms of Oppo and the stuff that you become famous for, for like you're running. Yeah. Was that so? Because you've never in this whole thing you've never mentioned going out for runs or being like you know loving running. Yeah. Was it an outlet at a certain point of your life or was it? just the goal that, you know, you found was obtainable. You know what, yeah, I mean, I'd always been fit being in the Marines running, but, yeah, I'd never ever ran for, for enjoyment, if you like, and then once I got the prosthetic legs and then they said, okay, do you want to run and blade? I was like, well, yeah, mm. I'll have a go with that. And then just realised how good running is, you know what I mean, how much all the endorph- end, was it, endorphins, endorphins yeah. Yeah. and all that, and... Just, just literally fell in love with it, and again, just became that kind of old me, that old Andy, come back, you know, that competitive. Right, okay, I want to run now. Can I run for twenty minutes? Okay, let's run for half an hour. Let's go, and, and just started getting, you know, with the running. But that come about really from from getting the dog when when my life did start kind of spiral out of control with the drinking and the gambling and the, and stuff like that. With me not having any purpose, you know, the dog gave me a purpose thought to myself, you know, that dog will need walking morning and night and it sounds a bit dramatic, doesn't it? But that dog saved my life. Mm. You know, he, he really did. He I think just everyone needs a purpose. We speak about it a lot on the podcast and for me getting this little Labrador and you know, it, it, it waking you up every morning looking at you saying like, you know, I want to go for a piss. You know, you need to go and walk that dog. You get out, you walk him you've got some fresh air, you think, oh, this is great. You know what I mean? That's It's got you out of bed, it's got you out of the house. If anything, it's it's got you out of the house. Mm. Again, it needs walking in the evening, so maybe you can't, can't go for those beers or you can't do it because you need to walk the dog. So just the little things that he changed in my life, which is the walks turned into longer walks, the longer walks turned into runs, and you know, I was taking him up snow and running down the beach with him. And, Although, again, I didn't realise it at the time when I look back, you know, he did save my life because mm. got me into so many healthy routines and healthy habits and, and got me fitter, got me healthier. And who knows, I probably wouldn't have took part in like things like the Invictus Games and I wouldn't have went on to break the 10K record if I didn't really get that that love for running that, that come with getting a dog. Yeah. I mean, you spoke about you running and obviously you're getting invited to these places with, you know, higher ups or whatever. When do you start to think of breaking 10Ks and, you know, the Invictus Games and, you know, being a competitive athlete, when do you, when do you, does it go from, you know, I was getting me out in the morning mm. and I'm going for a 5K or I'm going to ramp, when do you start thinking I want to achieve something with me running? I think I was very fortunate when I got injured, there was so much support for the military, there was a lot of charities and like Help for Heroes and the Royal Marines Charity Trust and, you know, Prince Harry was doing a lot and that kind of then kind of there was just so much support there were so many opportunities to try new things and do new things and when the Invictus Games which was Prince Harry's idea of like a mini Paralympics when that came to fruition firstly it was just cool to go and take part in it was a bit like you felt like, like a rock star do you know what I mean it was just like cool to get invited to like these like sport and things you know meeting people like Lewis Hamilton you know just meeting like sports stars it was just like it's pretty cool Um. And then obviously when and done quite well at it, you know, won a couple of gold medals and a lot of other injured soldiers then went on to the Paralympics and that was then the next goal. Sadly for me though, the longest distance in the Paralympics is 400 metres and I'm a bit more of a longer distance runner. That's when I started Googling amputee runners and found out about a guy called uh, Rick Ball who lost his leg in a car accident and he could run 10k in 37 minutes, 53 seconds. And that's when I thought, right, I want to focus on that. Mm. and then that's when my kind of life took on with the motivational speaking really kind of took off because I didn't just want to talk about being blown up in Afghanistan because as interesting as the story as that is I know a hundred lads have been blown up Yeah, it was all about what I've done next I always try and say to people you know life's not about well life is 10% the situation you find yourself in 90% what you do about it and I thought I can't just keep talking about that ten percent if I've not done anything with the ninety. Mm. So by taking part in the Invictus Games, that then inspired me to go on and break this ten k record. And again, that just brought loads of so many more amazing people in my life. Um, Tony Clark, we've had on the podcast. You know, got him as my running coach because I, again, I'm a big believer. Like, which has probably been a bit of a theme through the pod. It's about the people you surround yourself by. Yeah. You know, this whole pod was started, you know, with me and Tom, and, and then getting you on because it, it's about your team. 
you know, I'm here today telling my story because the team I had out in Afghan, you know, joined the Marines in the first place because of that team. So, you know, I don't think you can achieve anything in life without a good team. And by joining that uh, Liverpool Harriers with a, a belt and running coach like Tony, that then kind of spared me on to, to go and break the world record. Well, was there any correlation between, you know, that little running team you had? And I know I've seen the footage and I've spoke to you in depth about it, where they sort of, you know, set pace for you. And was the, the similar similarities between that and, you know, your team in the Marines in terms of, did you sort of feel at home again? Do you know what I mean? In terms of... Yeah, I mean, it wasn't obviously the same bond and stuff like that, yeah. the same friendships. These were just kind of people I turned up with twice a week and trained with. But without doubt, with the trust and their ability, yeah, 100%, they were just all fantastic runners. Yeah. You know, an amazing running coach and just fantastic athletes where you knew if you kept up with them, then you'd, you'd break this world record. And again, another, another kind of cheesy line I say, but, you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, you need to change rooms. Mm. And, you know... I was always the slowest runner in that group, but I knew just by hanging on to the coattails, you know, I knew I would improve. So every time I'd turn up and train, these are far better runners than me. But again, by me trying my absolute best to keep up with them, it was making me go faster. Yeah. The next session, I'd be a bit better and a bit better. So, yeah, there probably wasn't the same bond and same camaraderie as it was in the Marines, but without doubt, the trust and their ability to help me, pace me for this world record was, was yeah, unbelievable. And then obviously you break the world record. You have, you know, you've done a lot of cool things in your life that you've earned, by the way. But obviously you've got documentaries. You write a book that was shortlisted for the William Hill Sports Book of the Year, which is an incredible achievement. You and uh, the writer who did it with Phil Reed, that's just amazing. But sort of, then you're starting to develop your motivational talking, which is, well, your motivational speaking, which is going from strength to strength. Is that sort of a career that you felt comfortable with? Because it's a, it's a different pace to being a Marine. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're, you're a Marine and then obviously now you're, you're greeting groups and rooms. and. Yeah, you know what? The, the speaking come about all a bit random. It was um, my old school asked me to come in and do a little talk just about being in the Marines and stuff, which I'd done. I went great. Then they asked me to come back and talk about Iraq and done, done the same. And then after I got injured... They asked me to come in again, but it was always really informal, really chilled out. And I said, yeah, I can come in again, that's fine. And she said, oh, this time it's in, um, can you wear your medals and your uniform? And I thought, I don't want to get dressed up, fucking like 20 kids in the class, I'm sitting there in all my uniform. And she said, oh no, this time it's in Bootle Town Hall in front of 700 people. And I was like, fucking hell, and I need to actually practice something this time. And uh, Peter Gall, uh, my old English teacher, I sat with him and kind of wrote a bit of a speech. And it was um, it was just before I was having my leg amputated, and obviously it was the first time I've ever spoke ever spoke in public. But I kind of you know coined this speech, and I was a bit like, "Look, I'm about to have my leg amputated. I don't know what the world's you know going to look like for me, but you know you've just got to have hope and stay positive." That was the kind of motivational cheesy talk, and I got a standing ovation, and people were like, "Wow, amazing!" And and then obviously life took over. But it planted the seed there and then that I thought, you know what, yeah. well, I quite enjoyed that. And then as I got with the speaking like anything, you know, you've just got to have a go. And I got better at it. I learned what worked, what didn't work. But then as my life was kept on going, there was more things to add into the presentation. So I wasn't just talking about being blown up in Afghanistan. I was talking about, you know, going to the Invictus Games, I was talking about climbing mountains, learning to ski, things that I reflect back on from Afghanistan that I've learned from, um, and, and all this kind of stuff. And then obviously having Alba. And I've tried to then develop the speaking and just to... Listen, I'm not going to... I don't do a motivational talk and I tell you how to live your life. It's a bit of, look, this is what's happened to me. This is what's worked for me. And hopefully you can take some hope and inspiration from it. And by the end of it, hopefully you'll realise that no matter what you're going through, you know, by having hope, you know, anything is possible. And it's something, like you say, a lot slower pace than being a Marine, but I actually really like standing on stage and having that kind of... that pressure to think... You've got to deliver. You know, mm. you've got to make these people laugh. You've got to make these people feel inspired. You've got to leave, you know, leave a mark on these people. So, yeah, it is different from you know being shot at and blown up in Afghanistan. But I do absolutely love this speaking. Mm. It's, it's great, and I really, really enjoy it. Obviously, the book is something I want to touch on a little bit. You know, we just mentioned it briefly there. But you know, you're only th you're in your early thirties, but and, you know, you've wrote a book about your life. Was that the first moment you ever? put it on paper and, you know, 
actually dissected the stuff from everything we spoke about your mum mm. you know, being blown up you know the stuff with your dad your sisters was that the first time you ever told somebody and put it like yeah out I mean there? I, I always wanted to write a book but I didn't, again I didn't want to write a book just about being blown up in Afghanistan I wanted to wait until I'd done something so after I broke that world record that's when me and Phil started to speak and without doubt it's, it's the proudest thing I've ever, I've ever done because um Again, but coming back to my injuries, I didn't tell anyone that I'd, I'd, I'd lost my testicles, you know, and I didn't know whether I should put it in the book or not. And I thankfully did. And Phil done an amazing job of telling the story. And the amount of messages I've had from that book hmm. into the thousands now, I reckon, you have know, just people saying that it's it's helped them. It's, you know, they've been going through a tough time. They've read the book, it's helped them. You know, men who've went through fertility problems and issues and things like that, it's without doubt the proudest thing I've ever done and it was so therapeutic to, to sit down with Phil who is an amazing writer mm-hmm. um, we just sat down like this you know literally like this for a couple of hours and he'd, he'd you know he'd say what was growing up like and I'd talk to him about it and then he'd come back a couple of weeks later to say what do you think of that and I'd say oh yeah it's good maybe just change that bit to that bit we just done that for about a year 18 months and then before you know it he had this book it was the first book he's ever written I got nominated for Sports Book of the Year mm. up against like Tiger Woods, which was yeah. just mad to think. And again, yeah, it's the proudest thing I've ever done because I felt like I was able to, you know, get a lot of uh, skeletons out of my closet. You know, I was mm. able to be honest about like the gambling, be honest about what it was like to be told I can't be a dad. You know, all of these things I was just looked at my life, you know, warts and all. You know, some things I'm ashamed about, some things I'm proud about, but that that's my story. And and the job Phil has done. Um, it it's it's amazing. I still get messages now from it. Like it's been out three or four years, I think. Um, and it was amazing, and probably only because of the honesty I've shown in that book was probably the only reason I've been able to talk so openly about on a podcast now with you about everything I've been through because I did feel like it was you know getting a big weight off my back being so open in the book. Mm. How did you choose Phil? Like because obviously what you've spoken to him about some of the and things that you probably only think about when it's deep dark in your bedroom mm-hmm. you know what I mean? how did you choose him to to put it to bring it to life i'd known as I'd known as i'd read his dad's books and became uh, i'd worked with phil because he works for um, a football club so i'd worked a little bit with him on a few interviews and stuff so we knew each other already and then just get getting to speaking to him i just thought you know he's just a he's just a, he's just a lad like exactly like me mm-hmm. you know what i mean similar age to me um Someone else actually wrote a couple of chapters, a lady from down south, <clears throat> and um, lo- lovely lady, amazing family and stuff, but it just didn't feel like my voice, it didn't really connect with it. I filled on a couple of chapters, and it just sounds like me, mm. and I just think, you know, he's a boss lad, such a lovely lad, and yeah, it just seems to seems to know what it was like to be a scout, or a young lad who loved Liverpool, and you know, similar interests, similar personalities, and yeah, after a couple of chapters, I just felt like, yeah, this is this is a match made in heaven. Mm. I mean, we spoke about your whole life now, and you know, I've, I know you quite well, but I've learned things, and it's been an amazing chat. But what's the future then of for, for Andy Grant? What's the where are we going? What's the what's the future? Um, well, not the, what's the future for everyone? What's the future for yeah. you? <laughs> what's the lottery number? <laughs> yeah. You know what? Like I said, I love doing the speaking. Like I love, love, love doing the speaking. I get a real buzz from it, um, and the podcast. No, I, I love this podcast. It's podcast is a little bit about speaking. We spoke the other day about you know storytelling, and I think um, as long as I can sit here, hopefully with you, as long as you do, and uh, and Tom when he does, and just talk to people and hear their stories, and hopefully learn a little bit along the way. You know, I I just keep wanting to do that. I don't think I've got a real big grand answer anymore of like you know what what's life got in store for me. I feel to go a little bit deeper and just be like I just want to be happy. I just want to be a boss dad. I just want to be happy. I want to do the public speaking. I'm very fortunate that I've got a job that I love. I love doing this podcast, you know, a bit of a hobby for us, but it's growing every day. I want to keep on speaking to cool people and, and, and grow the podcast as big as it can it can get. And just see, see what happens. Like, I feel so, for years I always like, I want to be a Marine and I want to break this world record. I want to climb this mountain. But for now I'm like, I just want to be a boss dad. Mm. As, as boring as that sounds like, but I think 
Yeah, that'll, that'll, that'll do me. I mean, what fascinates me is, I know we're friends, but you are only in your early 30s and you've had a life that, you know, someone who was 75 could sit and go, I've had some life, me. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? But yeah. you still, you know, there's, we just spoke about a book, but you've got many, many, many chapters to, to still write. And I think the fact you are taking that sort of, let's just see what happens with it, yeah. is very probably a wise way to go because your life's been so 100% under mm. mile an hour that might be time to just slow down do you know what I mean enjoy yeah. the view and then sort of see where you go with it but yeah no doubt I'll go again and think about other challenge and stuff but for now yeah I think just concentrate on, on being a good dad to speak in the podcast and trying to be happy it's pretty hard to do at the moment yeah. the way the world is <laughs> yeah. so uh, if I can try and be happy I think I'll probably uh, probably be winning boss mate I mean we are friends but I hope we've done a good job Belt a lad. hope we've got everything out but Loved it, lad. unbelievable cheers George done